good evening and we are very happy to be here with you for another session uh, at uh, organized by chennai international center uh, let me invite mr lakshmi narayanan uh, trustee of chennai international center to welcome the speakers and begin the session please. thank you thank you vanita and uh, let me extend my welcome to all the participants to this chennai international center event a uh, very inter uh, very interesting event that vanita and the team and the program committee have put together in the stream of science and technology as you all know the chennai international center carries out a lot of intellectual conversations in various areas including science and technology economics politics culture arts etc in the area of science and technology we have had some interesting speakers and today is one such event where we have two eminent people one a journalist turned author who has been following or dedicated his life to the sphere of science and technology and another a renowned scientist a physicist a biologist professor gautam menon i'll let you know a little more about them as we progress uh, the context of this is what can developing countries do as far as science and technology is concerned more specifically pure science what have they done in the past which is the part that hari pulakat the author of a book he is going to talk about that that is space life and matter is the book where he has attempted to narrate the history of the past 50 70 years post independence some of the accomplishments of indian scientists some of the things that have happened despite the challenges that indian scientists have had and then professor gautam menon who is currently a professor in ashoka university is creating the future in the area of science and technology while uh, hari pulakat and this book will talk about or celebrate the past gautam will talk about creating the future that's the format and we are going to have the two in conversation uh it's it, the, the topic of science and the contribution of india to science is phenomenal not much recognized not much applauded uh i think this goes back to uh, one of the things as preparing for this i watched the video called the quantum indians that's something that i would recommend everyone watch everyone who's interested in science watches this is an award winning documentary talks about three of the greatest scientists in the 20th century early 20th century between 1910 and 1920 25 professor meghnath saha professor professor satyendranath bose and professor c v raman all three of whom were nominated for nobel prize some of them two of them multiple times one of them secured it professor c v raman secured uh the nobel prize the other two despite being nominated multiple times did not and this documentary talks about those aspects of the work that they've done and the work that they've done is phenomenal this is uh, i mean the uh, bose has given the name bosons to been fundamental particles in theoretical physics in the particle physics area is rich because of him and there are so many experiments that are going on in that area and it was a period when uh, science was celebrated you know and the places calcutta all three of them were in calcutta you know something unique about this two of them professor meghna saha and satyen bose passed out at the same year msc securing a joint first rank and continued their research in different different areas meghna saha is a well known astrophysicist and so on and of course we have a number of other people who were also nominated for nobel prize like e c g sudarshan uh, that was a i think it was a golden age golden period and some institutional infrastructure got created then which continues to stand even today the institute or the indian association for cultivating science iacs uh, one of the pioneering institutions in calcutta again and so on i can go on and on about the, what they did and it was the inspiring work done by those people that led to other scientists like homi baba uh, vikram sarabhai and later years satish dhawan satish dhawan used to be the director of the indian institute of science when i was at the institute i could 
you know, we would just go to see him, the tall figure with gray hair and that standing personality in that center, just giving a talk, just talking to the students and professors. Those are the great days. Uh, and then post-independence, several fantastic things happened in the field of science and technology, which is what Hari is going to talk about. I'll leave it for him to probably go into depth in specific areas there. From then, we come to creating the future. This is an area where a significant investment has been made, both in the institutions and individuals in India. You know, we are known for our quest for knowledge, the curiosity, and the, and the uh, inspiring figures that we have had in the past who continue to inspire people in research institutions and so on. Uh, you, you know, Gautam Menon is, the first time I heard the, his name recently, it was only day before yesterday. This is something that I must narrate here. We had a, he's, he's no stranger to Chennai, he's from the Indian, the, the, uh, the Math Science Institute of Mathematical Sciences. And uh, the other sister organization is Chennai Mathematical Institute. Chennai Mathematical Institute is trying to set up a center, uh, FC Kohli Center, in honor of uh, the founder of the Indian technology IT industry. And uh, we were discussing what kind of a model should we have for this center. Should it be on the lines of a Fields Institute in Toronto, which is for mathematical sciences, can we create something for computing sciences on a similar model? Or should it be like the Simons Foundation, grant fellowships, et cetera, et cetera. So there was, there was uh, Mr. Dr. Vijay Chandru. Vijay Chandru was the person who brought up the name of Professor Gautam Menon. And they said, Professor Gautam Menon is doing some terrific work in Ashoka University. What are you guys doing here? You should talk to him, tap his intellect to find out what shape should this institute take. So that is the context in which I heard Gautam Menon. I'm so happy to welcome him to this program and so happy to uh, be able to you know, talk to him in person in the context of what happened in the couple of days back. And, and it was not only Vijay Chandru who contributed, there was uh, Dr. Anil Kakotkar, uh, who's also on the board of CMI. He talked about cyber physical systems and the new area and what kind of research can be done. Why not take up one of those type of areas and do some work? And the thing that he goaded the, uh, the participant and the institute is to do some collaborative work. There are these institutes of eminence that have been created by the by the government. It's the, the, the areas of research, et cetera, uh, in multiple areas, you know, whether it is space or whether it's the area of biology uh, or in the, the particle physics or material science, collaborative work is the way to go forward. So he really encouraged us to look at, uh, you know, collaborating with all the other institutions that are standing alone. And the final point that I want to make is, you know, see the level of interest that people have, Mr. Uh, Dr. Emma Srinivasan, another, another board member of uh, Chennai Mathematical Institute, another very, very interested person. He's based now in Uti. So he had a, I mean, it's a fantastic office from which he was taking the Zoom call. We asked him, where is, where is he? Is it his house in Uti? He said, no, this is the Cosmic Ray Institute, something that has been set up and supported by TAFR. And many of us were in that call, didn't even know that there was such an institute in that place. So the the assets that India has created, the enthusiasm with which the researchers have, researchers have participated in many of the activities are seen in some applications like the space applications, the vaccine development and institutions like the HCBS or the Theoretical Studies Institute in Bangalore. But we don't hear about the individuals who are contributing and hopefully the two of you will bring out those type of characteristics of individuals who have contributed who inspire young scientists today, awaken the curiosity of young students, school-going students, college-going students, encourage them to, to view so many assets that you have. You know, if you want to learn physics, you just have to go and listen to Richard Feynman's lectures. That's it. You know, it's, it's the type of lectures that you, people like Gautam, me, and Hari didn't have the fortune to go through during our younger years. But the current generation is very fortunate. And so that is the platform on which science and technology stands here today. And to debate, to discuss, and to create the future from after celebrating the past, 
I hand over to Professor Gautam Menon, who is going to be in conversation with Thari Pulakat. And I hope you enjoy the conversation. And I'm sure we'll have time to take questions at the end. Over to you, Gautam. Thank you so much for these very kind words. And thank you to the Chennai International Center for this invitation to have this conversation with Hari about this really interesting and intriguing book. So let me just hold it up. This is what the book looks like. This is, it's called Space, Life and Matter. The, sub, the subheading is The Coming of Age of Indian Science. It's written by Hari, who's on this call. It's been acclaimed, of course, by a wide range of Indian entrepreneurs, scientists, etc. Kiran Shaw, Nandan Nilakani, etc. Many people have said very nice things about the book. And it's easy to sort of read it and understand where those words come from. As, as, as a, following my own reading of it in conversations with Hari, I understand that, you know, it, it is, it, although it isn't a science book, it's not a book that emphasizes the science, but the people who created it. And that say, speaks to the larger question of how do you build a strong, a technologically strong and scientifically strong country with very limited means and resources in the first 20 or 30 years since independence, what the constraints that these people had to contend with, and where did these remarkable people come from who had the vision to create things that were internationally competitive 30 years ago, 40 years ago at a time when I was also growing up, and to sustain this effort over, over a period of really, you know, sort of initiating something in the mid-70s and being able to carry it right up through the early parts of this particular century. So, that, I think, is really the central question that Hari's book is organized. It's a book for anyone to read. With You don't have to be a scientist in order to read it. It's a, it's a popular book. It's intended for the public. Um, my own perspective is that, as, as Mr. Lakshmaran mentioned, we do know of pre-independence Indian science. We know from movies like The Quantum Indian, of people like S.N. Bose, Meghnath Saha, C.V. Raman in his Calcutta period. But the broader spectrum of what happened after independence is a story that is not known well enough. If there is any name of someone who's considered scientist, it would probably be Abdul Kalam, who's known to the larger uh, group of Indians as someone who was a scientist, technically speaking, or then who came from the space program. But the other people that Hari deals with in this book, for example, M.M. Sharma, the chemical engineer, or um, CNR Rao, uh, Obed Siddiqui, these are names who are known to scientists in India, but they're not known to the general public. And what exactly their contributions have been to building up what we have in the current moment, I think is something is a story for everyone to know about. And that I think is a real sort of the, 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 the real special thing about Hari's book and what he's managed to do in thinking about it. So let me just sort of come to you, Hari, with my, my first question in this discussion that you said that when we think about our history, our post-independence history, you know, you, you felt that the, the influence of politicians and political thinkers has been somewhat exaggerated. Whereas those who really built India, in quotes, built up the structures that enabled us to see India as we are, as a strong scientific power, as a strong technological power, as a strong in, in, with the base in the IT industry that is known across the world, as well as a sort of a knowledge base, that has been ignored. So I just wondered if you could expand a little bit about that and your motivations for writing the book in that background. So the book began um, as a sort of an accident. Um, I, you know, accidentally, somebody called me up, an agent, and I signed a contract and I started working on it. But uh, I have been thinking about this for, for some time. Uh, although formally the book started uh, you know, with, with a contract, I have been thinking about this. And especially I have, uh, what uh, interested me is how did you know, science develop in India, as you said. And especially, it, this is probably of interest to all countries uh, who became independent and you start with nothing. Uh, what happens? Uh, and you, we find that some countries developed science, some countries did not. Uh, in the case of India, the science had developed before the British left uh, India, and which is very unusual. If you, if you look at all the colonies, uh, India is probably the only country, you know, if you ignore Canada and Australia, which is probably you know, not quite a good uh, comparison. Uh, there is no other colony, uh, a British colony or any European country's colony where science had come like this in India. Uh, how it started is, of course, is a completely different question. But at the time of independence, uh, people had started learning science. Uh, and we had already a Nobel Prize winner and, and two potential Nobel Prize winners, like, you know, um, Lakshmi said in the Quantum Indians. 
but uh, but these are isolated events and and some areas um, mostly physics mostly theoretical physics some experimental physics little bit of chemistry but if you look at uh, the entire uh, spectrum of science we had probably nothing uh, compared to what the, the big countries were doing so i was interested in in understanding how this came about uh, especially how does science develop at all you know is it because of a top down uh, drive or is it because from bottom up this is specifically what i wanted to understand uh, is it because some leaders who had a vision um uh, do certain things set up institutes have you know get money and and fund programs or is it because young people who want to do science keep pushing from below um it is hard to after working uh such years in journalism and writing a book it is still difficult to uh, to clearly say how you know whether what is more important but i feel intuitively that uh you need a top down approach a little bit but i think lasting change happens from bottom up you know because that is what the st- stories of all these people taught me because most of these people had their own personal drive and they persuaded others to do what they wanted to do uh, and if they couldn't do it they somehow found a way that may not be the best way but that is what they could do what what they could do so so i i think that is india its science got built up because these people persisted uh, in spite of all the uh, bottlenecks that they faced of course mm-hmm. people like baba and sarabhai and nehru were, were important uh, but i feel that their importance is probably exaggerated a bit so that that takes me to my next question very naturally that in the early part sort of post independence you have these figures like baba who started the indian atomic energy program you have sarabhai who started the space program both these people were patrician somewhat aristocratic in in the roots which they come from came from fairly well to do families had studied abroad in the case of baba and but the people that you talk about who come a little later who were in a sense hand picked by baba and by by sarabhai to to really push this along beyond this initial phase of 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 uh, of creation of these institutions and you know you mentioned govin swarup who is an important part of the book you mention um a bunch of other people ramsami of clri naida ma who started the clri but would you these people the sort of next generation that followed them in as, as you said really came up from grassroots they they were typically not from aristocratic families they were typically from families that didn't have any scientific background maybe they came from families of teachers at best but i think in one of those examples there was someone who was whose fa- father owned a theater and had no scientific that background sir. that was going that that was govin sir who had no family background in science at all so there's been one societal change just in that but i wondered whether you would illustrate with these examples we may be starting with govin swarup what was it about govin swarup's character that enabled him to come back to be called back by baba to begin to have the idea of setting up a telescope a radio telescope at first uti and then this huge effort at pune if you could explain that i think the read the listeners may not be familiar with that part of the history but that would be great to to discuss okay so um, this is where i said that the drive comes from below uh, it was surup's idea to start an astronomy program not baba's uh, baba may have thought about it uh, but he actually responded to a letter from suru when he was at stanford uh, with with some of his friends who wanted to return to india to start an astronomy program in tifa of course if tifa was not there he would not have written um, so baba is very very important in that sense um, but baba baba quickly recognized that this is an important area that this area is missing um, and to recognize that radio astronomy is important um, probably is not that simple because radio astronomy was a new field uh, in 1935 you know with the first telescope was built it was not even a telescope by modern standard so only after the war by the in the 50s that re- people started building telescopes and uh, govin surup applied for a job in tfr 10 years after that roughly 10 years and everything was new and at that point in india joined this program um 
and again when they had no idea what they would do even govind swarup of course he did a, did send a proposal uh, but when he came back he realized that he has to do something special uh, not routine things uh, because he wanted to solve the big problems so and that is how he you know suddenly one fine morning as they say uh, sitting in the library uh, got this idea of a big telescope which is uh, four times as bigger than any other radio telescope uh, to have imagine that we could do that uh, such things in india when nothing was there he was the only radio astronomer in the country at that time in some ways i mean if, uh, there was one nvg sharma and uh, one joshi uh, in in pl delhi but they had not seen radio telescopes the, the only person who had seen a radio telescope and worked with a radio telescope was govind sir uh, so that was this is a really courageous decision as they say you know um, why govind sir did astronomy it was probably an accident he you know everything is an accident ultimately you know you meet somebody uh, they, they introduce you to new things and then you get one thing leads to the other Uh, but uh, he wanted to come back he wanted to build astronomy in india he went, lived through the uh, freedom movement and he thought the science was important in india and so so that that's how it happened yes you mentioned that, 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 that yeah, you mentioned that he was he was injured in a demonstration in a, in in, a, yeah. in, a, in, in again for the freedom movement at that time and he was in, yeah, he yeah, had this yeah. suffused by these ideas of what could india do to become special it's part of your book yeah, yeah. um i'm also intrigued by something that you mentioned in your book about the difference in the characters of baba and sarabhai you said i mean you you mentioned that baba spirit suffused all big science and technology projects in the 60s and baba was known as a scientist of course we hear about baba scattering it's part of the textbooks sarabhai was not as well known as a scientist but seemed to have been a better manager he's made up for it through his hard work exuberance is a word that you use and his human touch and baba was methodical and sarabhai was intuitive and do you think that this 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 approach of sarabhai had any impact on the sort of people that he chose to build up the space program which you also talk about in the book what how, how do you see that the, the space program first in trivandrum then in bangalore expanding what was sarabhai and then later you are rao's role in this okay so sarabhai was more human than baba uh, human in the sense uh, baba was a little bit distant from from his colleagues sarabhai was not that distant although he had a reputation and people looked at him with awe uh they would because they were all in their early 20s uh sarabhai w- would go to their labs see them at work late in, uh, you know in the night uh and baba would come and go like you know in, at ifr uh but other than that uh, their personality i i don't know um once again it's all uh, you know i feel it's an all an accident uh, because your people want once you start something Uh, when once sarabhai started this people got to know this and they wanted to join the program this is a big deal you know space program you know in, in the 1960s uh, you know this was before the apollo uh, mission and people were talking after the sputnik so everybody was talking about uh, space in the world and a new, you know an independent country newly independent country 10 years uh, 15 years after independence you start a space program and young engineers who would listen to voice of america or bbc you know about about space program and sputnik and uh, go to the uh, you know moon pro- speech by uh, kennedy uh, and they get an opportunity to work on on the space program. of course it's nowhere near the us program but it's still a space program so everybody came got attracted and they came on their own uh, and then because they were also enthusiastic they just built the program from ground up Yeah, you mentioned that you are Rao would, would give talks and then encourage people for the excitement of doing of, of yeah. doing of the space program and then recruit in that way people often from yeah, relatively yeah. you know I mean not very well known institutions typically at that time but yeah. they, he would sort of fill them with an excitement that they were going to do something significant yes. and important and along the lines of what I, I sort of re- recall particularly from your book about the fact that many of the engineers at the original satellite systems division had no idea what it took to make a satellite. and that you you describe an interaction between arshia and goel 
where they figure out that neither of them can answer questions about both satellites so they said so they both decide to go to the library to read more about it and luckily the trivandrum did have a good library at that point so they could actually catch up so it's interesting that there was no i mean they had to create their environment for themselves it was not as though they were planted in mit or in a place which already had a large number of people who had been thinking for a number of years they made up their environment as they went along made it more vital made it more um, intellectually stimulating so that they could then push the the frontiers of what were known at that time so i i just wanted to ask you about you view much of this work in the 80s 90s and early 2000s as a prelude to very interesting things in science that are now going to happen in terms of of new space missions new new types of measurements that have not been done on on interstellar chemistry for example can you expand a little bit about that how you view the transition between the sort of setup phase and what is going to happen in the future so setup phase happened took a very long time um that was one um thing i learned it it, it, it need not have taken so long um you know, uh, only at the turn of the century uh, did people started thinking of of indian science in the global context but but by then india had liberalized and india india was looking at the world um you know international markets people were investing in india indian companies wanted to sell abroad all these things had Uh, it's its impact on scientists as well uh, now instead of asking uh, problems for the first time in india um, they started thinking about first time in the world now this is not really this is a very simplistic explanation you know in science there is no first time in india generally but what what uh, happened was they were looking at problems that they could solve with the limited uh, budget that they had you have to you know if you the new machine gets developed it takes years for, to get that machine in india so they would wait patiently and then when it comes everybody else has gone ahead so still you use that machine to do something something of importance to them to to india and to science but they were not necessarily a contemporary problem so that mindset changed uh, now there is no such thing uh, you know what we could do uh, we have to, the the contemporary problems had to be tackled and it's a gradual change um the institutions that got set up in the late 80s uh 90s it was and they brought about this change uh, especially in biology the biology is a small part of my book because this happened much later in in the period that i'm covering but um that was the change now of course 20 years in, um after that iits have also come up uh in the last 20 years this is a big change in indian science and research iits have become very very important in research it it was not the case through the 60s 70s and 80s probably even 90s so so going back you described the the history of an institution that i'm very fond of firstly the indian institute of science in bangalore how the idea really started off as a conversation between jamshed ji tata and swami vivekananda who was traveling abroad funded by the by the maharaja of mysore by krishna the wadayar and who then contributed 371 acres to to set up this institution the initial resistance from the british government to doing this the appointment first to the european director then cv raman was the first indian director of this institution and then you sort of it, it then moves on to discussing people important in that context sish dhawan as a particularly important figure as the director of of the indian institute of science in the 70s who then later moved up to move to head the space program and also the story of cnr rao a very unusual story in india again so the son of of it of it of a teacher from my sore area completely inspired by the thought of doing science a master from bhu and then later phd from purdue one of the he was 25 when he became a faculty member professor at uh, at a young assistant professor at isc and the, the, the he moved from there to iit kanpur and then came back and was later director and as you point out and he, you know, this he, this is a man who has had pretty much every scientific accolade that you can think of except for the nobel prize that's probably the only the only missing one from this very large thing what comes out again in your book as well as sort of in my own minor personal interactions with him is his incredible energy he, and he, when he came back to india there was very very little that he had to actually set up a working chemistry lab and scrounge put things together but and began to write papers and books at an incredible rate from you know both the isc which is probably a little bit of a backwater at that time iit kanpur which has just been set up so that 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 incredible energy 
that he brought to this larger scale vision of building up chemistry, specifically solid state chemistry in India. And the people he managed to get, Didi Sharma is the name that you mentioned, P. Pradeep of IIT Madras is a student of his. Can you talk a little bit about your view of how important CNR Rao was, first in setting up his own lab, then as a figure in scientific administration who pioneered many important um, you know, administrative responsibilities in this meter unit, the new ISAs, for example, in later years. What was his significance? So he uh, illustrated the best example of, of what I said earlier, where push from below, um, because he wanted to do chemistry, uh, whatever happens. He had to come back um, because his parents were getting old and they wanted him to come back. Uh, I'm not sure whether he would have come back if that was not the case. He may have. But it, 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 that acted as a very important push for him. Uh, but having come back, he found that he could not do science, the kind of science that he did. Um, it's not at, at that IIC was not doing good science at that time. They, had, they were doing very good science uh, in, in other fields, but that was not a field that he wanted to work on. Because the very language uh, of chemistry that he spoke was, was completely alien to to institute of science, no. So he thought in terms of quantum mechanics uh, and which the modern equipment, which were just coming in. So those facilities were not there. Uh, then how do, how do you do this? So he found a way, uh, you know, with, he built equipment, he went wherever he had to go. He went to other universities, did some experiments. Um, and then he, he learned to choose problems um, at that time uh, with, with, with great care. And he must have thought about what would it take for me to excel in, 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 a, in a situation like this. Uh, and that was probably one of the reasons why he became so productive because there are some problems you cannot do. So, but le at least let, let's, you know, be more productive. And he understood when he was in Purdue, the value of publishing. Uh, he saw that the, some of the best scientists published a lot. So he wanted to be productive. And that is how it started. Uh, and because of his personality, um, he never stops. Um, he went to IIT Kanpur, he got at the right environment. Uh, but still, it's, it's still not the best best place compared to the or Purdue. Or... Money was scarce, even in IIT Kanpur. Uh, but it was a much more open environment and he flourished. And when he came back to IIC, he was much more famous and he could get things done. Um, and Satish Devan was in charge. But even then, Satish Devan had limited funds. We had, didn't have a, the country didn't have a mechanism to, to fund science. The DST had not been set up. Um, and now there is DST, DBT, and there are all kinds of other institutional mechanisms. There was nothing at that time. The institute had a budget within that they had to work. Um, but CNR, uh, through his influence and through his personality and through his drive, was responsible for, for getting uh, all, all of these mechanisms here. He, one of the persons, not only, he was not the only person, there are many others, M.G. Kimenon, if you can think of, you know, a major figure in Delhi at that time. Uh, but CNR, what he did was, he wanted to imp improve his own condition. And he did not try just that. He wanted to improve, he improved everybody's condition. Instead of just getting money for him, he created an environment with, because uh, where science was being funded. Uh, that was his major contribution. And as a director, of course, he did so many things that he thought was missing at that, uh, well, he was a scientist, uh, including the how the campus looked uh, about to send the cows out uh, and you know, uh, you know the, put more trees in, in on campus and a campus became a beautiful place and and he would take decisions very very quickly you know without any uh, administrative baggage you, there yeah. is a story of you know, how ajay sood when he came uh, he wanted 18 lakhs he wrote to cnr rao on that page you know he himself is at 18 lakhs country you know and, and then it goes to the administration so if you feel a letter like that comes then there is nothing they could do then they have to find the money right so, yeah. So then we come to the part of the book that I really, I really, really enjoyed because I feel that it's a part that hasn't been spoken about enough. I speak about the part about M.M. Sharma, the growth of chemical engineering in the country, the role of, of, of synthetic chemists, pharmaceutical chemists, and uh, 
and and the growth of essentially pharmaceutical research tied to companies such as uh, you know, the Tata Chemicals, for example, is one example that you used. And again, this is interesting because these are all people. For example, M. M. Sharma and Raghunath Mashilkar. After that, who came from very simple backgrounds. M. M. Sharma didn't have money to pay for his for his hostel fees, and finally, a philanthropist based in Bombay had to pay for them. It was when he moved to Bombay from Jodhpur that he first saw running water for the first time, and then went to Cambridge and worked in Cambridge with with. Acknowledged Master of Chemical Engineering, Dankwards, and then came back at, and was appointed a full professor at the age of twenty-eight, and had to deal with all the consequent jealousies and difficulties that must have arisen from that. Very strong commitment to teaching, a strong commitment to, you know, making chemical engineering useful, in a sense. And again, what what was really impressive about that part is how he had to go around and scrounge from the company for small chemicals because they didn't have money to buy chemicals. and to and and to train himself and to train the generation of students in this in 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 being able to manage with very little but still maintain the highest standards and you mentioned that he was of course the first indian engineer to become a fellow of the royal society and from there we move on to mashelkar again coming from a relatively simple and humble background father died when he was young and his mother brought him up and and instilled that that desire that competitive spirit in him you you again you bring that out very well and how he joined in seal after naidama came went and interviewed him in london and offered him the job so as i said this is a story that i don't think has been told or at least is a story that i have not heard of in 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 sort of in this larger picture what drove you to 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 thinking about about this 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 part of this part of the history so the overall structure of the book um, took 2 years to develop so as i said i started just arbitrarily wrote down 10 things that came to my mind at that time uh, some uh, you know some institutions some people some companies uh, whatever i knew uh, uh, but it took 10 2 years to for me to work out a proper structure for the book um, when i understood enough about what had happened so i had to choose what do i include what do i not include i had to have a balance between breadth and depth if you have too many people um then you won't get enough space to to write about each one of them but if you have too few then it won't be a good sample so finally i decided about 10 to 12 people uh, and the areas to choose all also was not that easy because physics i sort of ruled out i mean not ruled out I mean chemistry was very important uh it it played a big big india that had done extremely well in chemistry uh in the last 50 years you know the you know because it not just fundamental chemistry but uh, we built industries big industries pharma industry uh, chemical industries they're all pretty large so chemistry sort of chose itself um biology obviously now it is big so i wanted to look at uh, the genesis of biology and in biology institutions at this moment are some of the best in the country and we had jena you know vijena also chose himself you know after cv raman was probably the best indian scientist in india and if if, if you look at the whole century 20th century jena could have been, you know we could say that he was as good as cv raman and there are people who say he's better so he also chose himself so the institution that he built uh, um um physics was in, do i hold do physics or astronomy uh, so i chose astronomy because astronomy is easy to tell the people everybody can relate to astronomy so it is important for me to make somebody read the book uh, it is not just important but once you choose something important then it's in, 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 it should be read and so it's it's people are interested in astronomy so in the physical sciences instead of physics i chose astronomy Mm-hmm. and it wasn't easy to leave out physics but i had to because there was no space um and lot of physics that happened in india had been theoretical so which does not quite fit into the narrative here because we are talking about building instruments you know big projects uh, not having com- components you know how you do do research in that sort of situation um so when it came to chemistry this was the logic um so okay. it became astronomy chemistry and biology chemistry was the first uh, uh a section that i chose but i i was surprised at the end 
um, I did not go by institution. I looked at people who had the big, biggest impact. Uh, there were 10, 12 people, and I chose four or five out of that. Uh, the interesting um, thing for me was out of those four, out of those um, uh, one, six people, uh, four had gone through UDCT. Mm -hmm. It was meant, not meant to be that way. You know, M, uh, M.M. Sharma, Mashalkar, A.V. Ramarao, and J.B. Joshi. J.B. Joshi comes, it's, it's a very small part of the epilogue, uh, but he, he, you know, he should have, there is, it should have been an a big chapter on him. I did not have space to write about everybody. So out of these four people, uh, you know, two had studied there, two had worked there. You know, it shows, yeah. you know, uh, you, that was not meant to be like that, but that, that shows the strength of UD City as an institution. Yeah, I, I just sort of wanted to also comment about Avi uh, uh, development in the anti-AIDS drug AZT, and then which was later marketed by Yusuf Hamid to the countries in Africa at this incredibly low price. Mm -hmm. That all you know, and and the fact that you could market it as a generic was really a game changer in the treatment of AIDS in 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 Africa. So I think that's a, it's historically that's also an extremely important point. So you you'd already mentioned Jane Ramson. I was just coming to that as, as part of your last part of your of your book on on the, on the biology part of it. Mm -hmm. And as you said, Jane Ramson was probably the most important. Indian scientist, certainly most important Indian biologist, closest to the Nobel Prize, probably that anyone any Indian has been to in, in working in India since 1950 or 1940 or something like that. Again, very remarkable. Um, his move to Bangalore, the setting up of the molecular biophysics unit at Bangalore, and then later the sort of expansion of biological research in Bangalore with the arrival of Obed Siddiqui from TIFR. So the story of, of Siddiqui, you mentioned this in the book, is also very interesting, brought back by Bhava from Caltech where he was working, entrusted with the job of building up molecular biology. The resistance that he faced from people, the, the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research at TFR is a, is a traditionally very theoretical institute. And suddenly there was this focus on mathematics and physics. And suddenly there was this biologist who came into this mix and had to manage and sort of get together a lab that is explicitly dealt with biology. This must have been very difficult, but his contributions towards building up molecular biology in India are, are, are I think really remarkable, and that comes out in your narrative, in the in the in the way that you that you describe it. So let me just go on to a couple of broader general questions since we're now reaching the the, the question point. Um, the first is that the numbers of women who figure in this book is actually fairly small. You mentioned Biba Chaudhary, you mentioned Anapurni Subramanian, but overall it's really a male-dominated narrative across this. So I was just wondering whether you you try whether it was just said there were just not enough women at that point in these positions where they could uh, where, where where they had prominence, what, or was the social constraints? How do you see this? What was happening at that time? So uh, the book is sort of a representative sample. Uh, uh, of things that ha happened, and that I think that holds true for the gender uh, uh, balance also. Uh, there were, and I did not choose it that way. Once I chose, I realized uh, this problem, and then I wanted to um, correct this. But uh, in the at least in the early years, I could not. But then uh, it's it's. I also wanted the book to suggest. Uh, more than say things openly in ma many many aspects, so this brought in a certain amount of ambiguity to the book, uh, which which I like actually. You know, I wanted it to be that way. Uh, if you read the book carefully, you can see the you know if you come to the later generation, you can see more women appearing, uh, and in some cases, I've also mentioned uh, the situation uh, in which they came to science, and uh, some of the barriers that they faced uh, is mentioned there. Uh, but not full full blown narrative, but it's it's there. You know, if you read the book from end to end carefully, it it is obvious that uh, the first three four decades were mostly men, uh, and then later uh, more women started coming in. And by the end, you can see you know very very good uh, you know prominent women scientists. Uh, uh, so the, the other interesting thing to me about looking at the sixties and early seventies compared to now is a huge amount of, okay, I don't know about huge, but the considerable autonomy that people like Baba and Sarabhai and, and to some extent CNR a little later, 
that you mentioned that they were able to make offers to for example naidama makes goes to the london and makes an offer to to uh, to the young uh, mashelkar it's impossible to imagine that happening now because with the whole sort of superstructure of selection committees and letters of recommendation and interviews and so on we, i mean i see this in a sense as a much more fair approach now it ensures that no candidate is left out that there is no favoritism in this that you're not hiring a relative or someone who just happens to be your student etc but i also see that the imperatives of that time the fact that there were relatively few people in science the need to identify anyone who had the leadership potential and the vision to be able to see this of the the picking of of ur rao for example was all of this i think was quite crucial at that time so i just wondered how you there seems to also have been a very important relationship between the political leadership in that case indira gandhi across much of that period as well as with with sarabhai and with baba that enabled them to have the freedom to actually do this how would you see that i think has changed how how would you see this particular question now so uh, there are so many things that can be done uh, in a startup nation uh, which is not possible when you become big um, so india was a startup nation in the first 30 40 years just like startup companies when the company becomes big you have to establish procedures uh, so so that was a case in uh, in india science was very very small um, you know probably indira gandhi nehru or indira gandhi knew personally most of the big scientists many big scientists at least they knew them knew of them uh, but now that is not the case this is the this the system is pretty big um but it's still possible to hire somebody if you really want um many of these hirings happened because they wanted to establish a certain field and they were, uh, and they identified the best person to start that field and and brought that person so it was done properly uh, in most cases so they of course they would have been offered uh, a job uh, immediately but then they come and advertise for a post that only that person can fit you know mm-hmm. so and then you apply that that this is this person is an overwhelming favorite so the, the person is hired uh, that is how it happened and i think that can happen even now if you're looking to expand into a new field but if you hiring in an established field that is not possible uh, and many fields are established now um, that's a difference in terms of political equation people say yeah it is a function of the size more than anything else and all interest of politicians in science went up and down all the go up and down all the time in, in all countries sometimes they they are interested sometimes they're not interested um i don't think there is any any any, any division in, in even in political parties uh, there have been uh, all political parties sometimes support science sometimes they don't uh, There's nothing to do with ideologies it more yeah. circumstances on the person in charge than anything else so i wanted to ask you about the parts of the that are left out of the book you've already answered this at some level you said you didn't want to deal with purely theoretical areas you didn't want to you left out physics in preference to sort of astronomy and space based science etc etc but so those are all in a sense large omissions because for example it omits indian mathematics which was very significant you know, in in terms of the story of indian mathematics it the creation of both a group at chennai at, around loyola college as well as in bombay in tfr that baba's hiring of kc chandrashekar and to build up this very very vibrant group of, of of students and faculty members and people from all over the world that's a story that again i think is interesting that liquid crystals is is something that you tangentially allude to but this is in raman institute you mainly talk about the development of radio astronomy under radha krishnan but you leave out the other large part that bang that the raman institute is famous for which is a liquid crystal group ecology various types of development of biology etc so these are things that you have left out if you were to write it again is and you know this is imagine that you had the luxury of having a 1500 page book let's say not that not that a publisher would agree to sell that what would you put in so the the focus of the book on is on building science uh, under constraints um so under severe constraints of money severe constraints of culture cultural attitudes um, and other things and and lack of a, an industry here in in the country these are the th- things that are necessary to build science uh most of these things do not apply to uh, theoretical sciences including mathematics of course you need a community Uh, you have to be switched on you have to talk to people you have to attend conferences you need to, the journals uh, in time 
Um, so all those things are so theoreticians also face a lot of difficulties, um, but not at the level that the experimentalists face. So once you choose the theme, a lot of uh, subjects you get excluded automatically. Um, if I have to do this again, um, which I'm trying to do now, expand a little bit uh, to to expand things. I did not uh, write enough, in, in my opinion. Uh, especially towards the end, um, I don't think I would add anybody, uh, anything, because then you can't tell a story. Uh, uh, you have to choose what you can do. Uh, you know the same uh, uh, logic that Sienna Rao must have faced when he you know, to choose problems that he can do, and and if you choose problems that you cannot do, not because of difficulty but because of infrastructure, then you do nothing. Uh, so I had my own limitations. I had limitations of time, limitations of budgets, limitations of uh, what is available. You know, many institutions have uh, uh, preserved good archives, TIS especially, but many others haven't. So when you write, want to write about something, how do you un understand what happened? And if you, especially in the 40s and 50s, people have died. And how do you, how do you know what Chandrasekhar did? You know, are his students alive? How much can, how do they know? Uh, there is there are limitations about what you can understand, and so I chose areas that I could understand, understand uh, for which there is enough material in the country. Uh, they may be difficult to access, but they should exist uh, for me to write something. So that was another factor, uh, and communicating to the public also is an important aspect. So that also limited some some areas. Although chemistry was difficult, I, I did not want to drop chemistry just for that reason. Uh, but communicating mathematics is quite hard, and especially in a book yeah. like this. It doesn't, it yeah. wouldn't fit in. I agree. So this is my penultimate question, and then and we will come to some of the last questions that I want to ask you. And that's something interesting from the point of view of science policy. These, these big steps forward for Indian science that you mentioned, they're all associated with what we call institutes, that is the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, the National Center for Radio Astronomy, the Brahman Research Institute, the Indian Institute of Science, and so on. The amount of work, so the only people associated with universities that I can think of are GN Ramachandran from Madras University. In a sense, the UDCT was a part of Mumbai University, but, very, but you know, was trying to carve its own separate niche from pretty long ago. It's only although they were formally became independent, only somewhat later. But apart from that, the only other institution that really figures as a thread in this is IIT Kanpur. BHU, because again, it trained CNR Rao, who then went abroad. But IIT Kanpur is a crucible for many people who many of the names that you mentioned were trained at IIT Kanpur, maybe have gone abroad and then came back to India to start that. So, so this is an, a, 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 some issue of worry for many people who think about science policy. Did we put too much of our energy into building up institutes that were standalone, dedicated to high science, and neglected the natural home for science, which should have been the universities at that point? What's your reading of it based on, on the book and in your research? I don't know why this was done like this, but I don't think universities would have succeeded much uh, if, if, we, if we had tried to grow universities. Universities declined because they were all state controlled, uh, state governments, uh, not the central government. Uh, and uh, there were many political appointments uh, you know, in, in the universities and universities which were very, very good at that time declined because of this reason, you know, University of Madras, University of Bombay, uh, Calcutta and others. So in that declining state, uh, I don't think it was possible to, to bring, bring it back. Uh, and B Baba realized this, that is what he what Baba thought even Indian sort of science was not good enough because they used to work on problems that were not contemporary. So he wanted to set up a model. So his idea was to set up a model, model institution where he could do, I mean, he had his own aims. He wanted to do science himself and he didn't find an institution where he could do that. But because he wanted to do, do that, he set up a model institution, but others also flourished. Um, you know, just in the same way that Siena wanted to do chemistry and so he created an environment where everybody could flourish. Um, so I don't think it would have been possible to build these universities you know, with, with, you know, with state control state government control um, because they had their own compulsions and it is very, very hard to uh, achieve any sort of independence in that environment. 
Um, so the, the 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 question sort of again, I, I probably have one more question after this. The one important trend in the part of the book that deals with chemistry and chemical engineering is the increasing pressure on organizations such as the National Chemical Laboratory, as a unit of the Con- Council of Scientific and Industrial Research (CSIR) to move from a situation where they were happily doing fundamental science to thinking in a much more applied manner to look at to to earn their income as far as possible from external grants from private sources for which they would do consultancy shifting that to 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 a much more um, market focused market directed intellectual property creation thing so, so certainly i know that this was traumatic for for the csr system over the last few decades i think now it may be time and this was pioneered by marshall kar as you point out in in this many people born but certainly he brought many of these uh, these threads together now looking back in your historical analysis how, how do you think that panned out so csr was set up specifically to do industrial research and of course fundamental research it's not possible to do industrial research without doing fundamental research i mean i don't think you can even separate the two you can do just just fundamental research and not do any in, in, industrial science but i don't think that science would be very good uh, in in especially in areas that are relevant uh, to industry um, you know, working on industrial problems gives you ideas to do fundamental uh, you know your basic science also it it works both ways um but then they did not do it why they did not do it i i, I don't know the you know it just they didn't do it um and the one of the first uh instances where they were forced to do was after the patents act 1971 uh this was done because of industrial pressure uh, you know the pharma pharma pharmaceutical companies put pressure on on the government and indira gandhi had the new patent act but having amended the patent act you have to do what you know these molecules have to be you know, developed so who is going to do it so she sent a letter to all csr laboratories csr would be the first institution to think of um and the director of ncl at that time tilak vd tilak called a meeting of all heads and said that you have to work on industrial problems now and there was a lot of resistance uh, in fact some of them said if you want us to work on industrial problems you have to give us industrial salary uh and so, some of the best scientists in ultimately went out went out of ncl not only because of this but this may have been a trick they had personal reasons also uh, but that was the first time and ramarao was sitting there in, in that meeting he was a very junior person and he saw this and he had anyway come from judy city uh and then he by accident he got in touch with hamid uh he had gone to bombay for some other reason and somebody took him to see hamid and 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 this in this meeting he started working on a problem on his own he understood that this is this is an important uh, issue and he has to work on something um and that led to a contract with sipla and the licensing agreement and once you have one then others see and more things follow so, so yeah. it's a combination of circumstance and 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 accident and over the next 10 15 years they did a lot of uh, industrial projects again you know driven by ramarao and later others also joined but they were working only for indian industry dr mashilka the, 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 what he brought was working for multinational companies um, because if you work with multinational companies you tackle problems at a different level uh, and that will help you to work in your own come back you know yeah. um, So the, the the last question, and after that I'll pass it on to Mr. Shankaran, is it's more of a comment than a question. That when I look back and I try to understand the, the constraints and the difficulties which were the scientists in the seventies and the eighties worked with, this seems incredible to me looking back and understanding. I particularly like that story in your book when Ramarao needs to get a patent, needs to look at a patent to see what was filed, and then discovers that he has to buy, he has to you know send an amount of one dollar yeah. US. in order to get it and but in order for that to happen a requisition has to be sent to the rbi to release 1 dollar that yeah. was the state of our, of, of our finances at that point and then you know the other examples of 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 um, shamma walking going around collecting chemicals in small amounts from manufacturers in bombay who they they would it's it, it's sort of hard to, and and you know just making 
cloud chambers by stitching in metal sheets on top of each other. All of these are, you know, when when we think about Indian science now, you buy off the shelf, you don't make so much anymore. But the conditions under which these pioneers functioned at a point where Western laboratories were doing the same thing, were much, much better equipped, much, much better in a position to get this. And the fact that they achieved so much is really quite remarkable, especially before 1991, with the liberalization of the Indian economy. I find, you know, that again is an important strain that runs through your book. What they had to struggle struggle at, it's sort of, it's, it's hard to appreciate that now going back, looking backward. Yeah, but it's yeah. an important point that, that you bring out very well in the book. Is where I just wanted to say that. Lakshmi, do you, do you, do you want to go ahead and, and do you have any questions for Hari? Or... Your, your sound is uh, off, I think. Uh. Are you able to hear me clearly now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Very, very interesting conversation. Lots of uh, different topics that are, uh, you know, I could, I can relate to the challenges that Hari had, you know, in a, in a concise book, if you have to attend to talk about the various scientists that we had, you know, you, you, you cannot leave out individuals. And I think he has made the right choice by leaving a subject saying that, hey, I'm not going to deal with the subject of physics. And that takes away their whole lot of pressure. One of the thoughts that I had was, and unfortunately, I haven't read the book yet. I'm sure to read that. While we are talking about individuals, are there institutions that these individuals have created or have been part of that have as a sustainable focus, can continue the research, et cetera, et cetera. You know, uh, specific things, uh, while individuals may have contributed, for example, the Department of Science and Technology and CSIR, these are large institutions. One of them, more specifically coming to Chennai, we have the Leather Research Institute that seems to have kind of created an industry uh, in that. So are there specific examples or is that the topic that Hari would like to explore as we go forward or Gautam has some ideas about how to set up those type of institutions that would have greater impact? Maybe I can go ahead and, and, and then Hari please, can and please. fill in. I mean, I think there are some institutions in India that I think are successful because they have been focused. For example, I would think of the Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research in Bangalore as an institution that is largely focused on material science and I think feeding into it, but also have a biology component, also have an ecology and evolution component. This is a sort of somewhat broader approach to, but but really around the interests of CNRO as originally conceptualized. It's really very very high end. That's one institution. I would think of the Raman Research uh, of the, the National Center for Biological Sciences again as a fab, flagship institution technically a part of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, but has its own, in a sense, reputation within, with, within the biological community as being a special place. So I think things like this do turn up. It's often you, you need a visionary leader to start things off, to have a vision, as well as the credibility to be able to sell it to government in order to be able to fund it and to raise money for it over 20 to 30 years, the time that it takes for an institution to, to stand up on its feet. That, I, I don't know, I mean, I see fewer examples nowadays. I think the, the big pioneers who set up the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, set up the space program, you know, had had the had the relationship and the trust of government in a way they were able and and they were remarkable leaders. They were able to do this. Now, big, with the size of the scientific establishment growing to the scale, I think it's harder for an individual to do this anymore. There has to be groups. There have to be committees. They have to be sort of look at what directions are important in the future. And finally, you need a good person to lead it. But I think that the isolated leader starting something off, I think, is probably less of it now. That's my personal feeling. But Hari, what do you think? Yeah, it it is hard to uh, maintain um, your glory for very long, and it hasn't happened in the country. You know, the institutions have been uh, important, and departments also have been important and have been at the forefront uh, during various periods. Uh, but there is no one institution that I can think of that had maintained its leadership at the same level uh, over the last 70, 70 years. Um, you, you know, CIFR uh, was, was very important and now it's relative importance has declined. I mean, it's still a ma- major institution, but if you consider the relative importance uh, of TIFR to Indian science, it is, of course, it has become, we have become very big now. Not very big, but it's still much bigger. MBO uh, went up and down. NCL went up and down. IIT Kanpur went up and down. Um, so I, I don't know why this happens in the country. Um, 
I'm sure everywhere that it happens, but uh, it's, it's hap- seems to happen very quickly in India. Uh, I don't have an answer. Uh, yeah, maybe it's difficult. It's, difficult. It, <laughs> it, it's something that needs to be debated. I think the every time the uh, the government takes an initiative, I think there are several institutions more in the area of education that the government has tried to create. Uh, just to model like the IITs, you know, you have these ICERs, which is focusing on this uh, scientific and engineering. Again, a little more research orientation. They set up this SCRB board that they have. Uh, SCRB has, you know, various powers and they have the requisite funding. But when institutions or initiatives like this are started by the government, you know, it takes a certain uh, it's a kind of a bureaucratic approach. Like, for example, if you want to apply for a specialized, you know, I was talking about this cyber physical systems. And if you want to start something and get some government funding, the first requirement is, do you have land and do you have 30,000 square feet of building? So it's the physical infrastructure that the government seems to focus a lot more than the intellectual infrastructure. So an individual who has some specialized interest goes to a government body and says, I have great interest. I've got these type of students who are passionate about working in this area. Allow me to do something. Please fund me. That doesn't seem to happen. That's one such problem because we have, it seems that we have come to depend on the government for these initiatives, purely for the financial uh, needs. But the government, while willing to spend on research, does not know how to spend. You know, the, the, the way they look at it is, uh, is it going into the right hands? Do they have the physical infrastructure? How will it be managed? Would a government nominee be required right from the beginning to monitor and control? That's the mindset. Whereas large amount of funding from private individuals or private corporations are not coming. Of course, now there is some CSR contribution that's coming, but that's going only to the existing institutions to create something new. You know, like you mentioned, a pioneering work, a solid figure who takes the initiative and the leadership is perhaps lacking. Uh, It's lacking, in my view, because there isn't sufficient interest shown by industry to back those people and create an institution. That will take years to develop. But then at the end of it, it will be a great success story. I mean, that's one of the views that I hold. I would like your views on should the government be playing the type of role that they're playing right now? Or should private philanthropy should come in in a bigger way as far as research is concerned? Uh, no, private philanthropy has its place, but it's just, you know, it cannot sub- be a substitute for government funding. The scale is, you know, the money needed is very large. But uh, there is also a problem. Um, it is very hard for anybody to understand uh, what science we should do, uh, con- what, what the, the areas that contemporary uh, scientists work on the problems that excite them and the relevance of uh, that problem to a country like India. Uh, this is probably true for every country. Uh, even if you go to the US and I talk to the politicians to make them understand the problem that we work on um, is important for it for for, for the whole world and for the U- US. Uh, it's not that simple. You know that's why that frame a statement of that uh, lady. What's her name? Um, she was the vice president uh, candidate nominee against Obama, along with um, Clinton? Ala- no, 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 no. She was in Alaska. And yeah. the Republican uh, Sarah, Palin. Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin. Yeah. So Sarah, Sarah Palin says, you know, people do waste money on fruit fly research. You know? So without knowing that fruit fly research is the, is the most important uh, thing in, in biology. Uh, so science as it, as it advances it becomes very distant from from the public and if it distance becomes distant from the public uh, politicians reflect public attitudes largely uh, so politicians also become distant uh, this is a problem um, and uh, of course there are many you know there is no one uh, big solution to this everybody has to work together to to close this gap otherwise you know 50 years from now and nobody will know what, what, what people are doing in, in the labs and why they should be doing such things at all. And you, you know. Yeah. And I, I, want to, I want to disagree a little bit with Harry on this point. I think there is much more space for private, um, for private philanthropic funding of science. We're seeing, I mean, I, partly it's because I, I, I work in and currently in a university that is a private university funded completely philanthropically. So I do have a, a different perspective on that. I think there is space. I would think that the major lack right now is a lack of a good industrial research base. 
and i think hari mentions this when he talks about the csr system that talks about the role of ncl and udct but that's just in that particular niche area and there's certainly much much more space for that to happen there's much much more space for a closer relation for example bell labs in the us was a complete engine of innovation it was doing extremely important work on the fundamental side and was able to translate that into the applied side we have no such analog in india we have no point at which private companies fund theoretical work fund pure research with the expectation that some day this may lead to an applied to movement on the applied front and they're willing to lose money on that until that actually happens so these engines of innovation that are really funded privately is something that is absent in india what we do have is a government model where the government funds money but then the question is does it put a lot of money in one institution or does it try to spread it out on 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 the grounds that sort of more democracy is better what is the best way of doing it should india go in for frugal science with smaller budgets for departments or should it put large amounts of money in so called big science projects where you can't have too many people working these are large international collaborations they may be frontier in some sense in a global sense but it's not clear that the large number of indians will really benefit from that so that's where i i see a role for private philanthropy there which i think is important and absent but i see an even more important role for industrial research really at the level like that at least by an, by a an factor of 10 or a factor of 100 more than what it is currently now that will provide jobs that are vital for the country at the moment it will provide the sort of avenues for 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 phd holders for people trained to get jobs that are involved in research that is useful to 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 india i don't see that happening Right. so philanthropy That's is good, quite important but, but you know it's not a substitute for government funding you know we should not fall into the trap of thinking that because philanthropy is a funding government can step back a little bit oh, 100% that, you know. absolutely yeah, yeah. Uh, there i agree with you 100% absolutely that is that's an that's an important point hari that you made the moment you see large sums from the private sector coming in to research the government has the tendency to pull out and say that hey it is being reasonably funded and that's the way to go and pull back that isn't something that should uh, we'd like to see that that brings to the obvious question of collaborative research you know is there sufficient collaboration that's happening between the various research institution both on the industrial research side privately funded government funded i mean examples are there are uh, people claim that the jack welch research center in bangalore you know the, the number of patents they file is uh, so many not only are they doing research in the areas that are relevant to ge but they are doing it in other areas i'm sure there are other industrial research institution like that would it make sense for them to actively collaborate with the researchers in academic institutions and other government funded research institution and uh, if it is if it does make sense then what is the platform is there a platform that's available for them to collaborate should one create such a platform any thoughts on that i i i think the government the csr and so on is very interested in this in, in sort of creating the platforms that are required for this interaction one point of 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 view that i have is that hirings in universities have not really reflected this response to the fact that you do want to make these connections especially to industry especially to industrial type of research if you look at any typical department that you get in 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 a typical university in the country the focus is not necessarily one that is useful to for example an industrialist that is setting up in that particular area even from the point of view of the basic research that might be applicable so i think i think a mindset has to change that is that we must train our students better to look for avenues where they can apply their research to to a larger context and not just publication and physical review b or physical review d should not be the 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 necessary ultimate goal of every physical scientist in this but to 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 create the academic atmosphere necessary for a good industrial and applied research base that i think is somewhere where we have failed and you know we we are putting these bandages on in various ways Right. but they're only bandaids and if we change something fundamental nothing much will happen is my personal yeah. opinion yeah there's still a gap between what the industry wants uh and and what the university is is prepared to give um because you know there is there is a gap the universities can go I mean, scientists can go uh, only so much in their opinion but uh, industry can come back come only a certain distance and in between them there is still a gap uh it, be, it is because of that gap that things are not happening as much as it should uh, and it also is a function of what companies want to do 
where what sort of leadership they want to take in, in a global uh, you know what sort of problems they want to uh, tackle what products they want to launch they if you're not ambitious you don't need researchers you know? um so it's a, it's also a function of ambition but having said that i think this gap is slowly being closed by startups uh, over a period of time it is the startup that will that will bring uh, academia and industry because they themselves have grown out of universities so they know what it is what value can add what and take they also know where to take and you know, how to take the research from a university and and develop it themselves which the large companies may not quite know yeah and then your your interaction in the, the process of writing the book you interacted with a lot of people uh, and also some of the people that you refer to in the book way did they have a collaborative mindset did they reach out to other institutions all over the world as part of the research or they were pretty much worked in isolation what is the yeah. what india, the india, nature india, of india was not a place for collaboration mm-hmm. till very very recently even now collaboration is probably uh, not that well understood I mean, collaboration now means actually international collaboration also you can't do science without international collaboration uh, and in this current set of uh, environment after covid in all countries and also driven by trump and, and other people there are everybody is looking inward and you know this is not this is not good what is this thing i don't i mean one one uh, has the uh, you know the example of ecg sudarshan and gobar and how it they exchanged information and then that led to led to some unpleasantness in terms of uh, claiming rights for what happened in today's context i think that is that problem at least is solved because it is open people publish immediately there is uh, documentation that's available what happens in one corner of the world is available immediately to the rest of the scientific community so much so the environment is really conducive for a lot of collaborative work and you can reach out to a person immediately so physical structures probably matter much less today than it did in the earlier years any views on that and so i mean the point that i'm coming to is you know if you say that you need a large you know 20 acres of land for a university so much of this may not be the you know gating criteria for starting institutions it so depends mm-hmm. what you do um if you look at crystallography uh, would you mind to say something sorry you were saying something? go ahead go ahead after you after you go ahead go ahead depends on what you do um if you look at crystallography um uh, after mbu started uh you know, they have ha- built slowly built their equipment uh, and uh, at at some point they wanted to synchrotron uh, and if you go to big universities you know countries like china and us and many european countries have large number of synchrotrons india still doesn't have synchrotron there is one in indore uh, but it's not really you know uh, the, the state of the art so you can't do some solve some of the problems in structural biology without synchrotron um so what does it take to, to you know build a synchrotron probably a billion dollars and you to maintain it you need power enough power to power an entire city um you know how do you do that um so in uh, biologists in india try to use synchrotrons that is available in other countries in in especially i think in italy the third world academy of science um but synchrotron is a special case uh there are areas of science where you cannot do without without good equipment uh, it's, it's, let me have the, to create it so. yeah let, let me make a related point regarding collaboration and just to show you that everybody every government agency will say we encourage collaboration we want this to happen there is an indo us into something or the other but at a practical level if you if an if an institution wanted to have for example a natural collaboration with its neighbors let us say with sri lanka with china you know who is technologically fairly advanced and certainly would be a nat- they are also much closer to us it's it's easier that the distance between chennai and, and beijing is relatively small compared to the distance between chennai and new york the bureaucratic barriers to just doing that to having a meeting in which you can call chinese scientists or you know the scientists from any of this local part of the world are huge the ministry of external affairs must give you permission to do that what do they know about science why are we building in barriers that really should not be there if we want a country to to advance in this scientifically our natural collaborators should be those closest to us and the sort of the we should not always have to look far to the west 
to find people who are doing the sort of thing that we would do, who are better equipped in terms of synchrotrons, in terms of high, of, for instance, the example that Harry made, in terms of high technology required for us to do these experiments. So I think that's, again, a mindset that has left, you know, where, where you have politics intruding into what really should be scientific questions. And that long term really hold India back. These are things that I think we should think about. I think the Indian Academy of Science should think about. People should think about this at high levels. What is it that we want to achieve? And what's the best way of doing it? Absolutely. I mean, good point. I mean, both of you make some good points. One of the other related things that we can comment is if there is infrastructure, equipment that is available elsewhere, and if you want to work on a particular thesis that requires, let's say, an uh, 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 ion collider, uh, it's, it's, it's possible for us to do that experiment elsewhere without having to have that equipment here in today's exactly. context. So that is, that is the type of collaborative thing that probably, hopefully, will come about. But, uh, you know, there may be hurdles that we have to cross as we go along. So I think I there is just, one question. There's one question here from that was addressed to, the, to us, which I can sure. just yeah. pass in Hari's direction. And then maybe you can you can wrap up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you can go ahead and look at that now. Yeah. So, so the question yeah. is, why isn't there adequate recognition for scientists and technocrats in public media and the public arena? What is your, your feeling about this? Oh, so... Uh, <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, there isn't enough recognition. You know, when we talk about national heroes, uh, scientists don't figure in that. I don't think any real hero figures in their national heroes. Um, any real hero means, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, sort of belittling the achievement of any, of any in any field. Everybody, you know, you know is hero. But uh, people who worked in, in some of these fields and, and built a foundation, um, they're not recognized because it's hard to understand what they did. Um, it is it's hard to see what a Tendulkar did, you know, or, or an actor did, uh, or even a politician did. Uh, but it's hard to understand what a scientist did uh, or an engineer did. Uh, what is that person's contribution? And how does that uh, fit into the overall context of, of, of the country? If that person was not there, the, the question that a Royal Society asked when they give a, a fellow of the Royal Society, if that person was not there, what would have happened, you know? So you can ask that question, if this fellow was not there, what would have happened to India? We, they don't, we don't know how to answer that question. You know, so that, that is That's, the main reason. Yeah. Yeah. There are a couple of more questions on that. You know, just to uh, add to that comment, I mean, maybe we set the bar very high as far as public recognition of these scientists are concerned. People probably know about the Manjul Bhargav. Uh, because he accomplished something that is at the, at the top end, and uh, there are several levels of achievement that is not uh, probably getting recognized. So just two questions, I'll combine it. That will be the last. We are uh, coming towards the end of the year, the time allotted to us. One from uh, Mr. Uh, from uh, Bino Daniel. How can we imbibe the interdisciplinary factors of learning in the regular class session, especially in astrophysics? That's one question. And there is one Vijay Kumar Krishnamurti who is complimenting the two of you for a wonderful conversation. He's saying scientific outreach and communicating the importance of science to the public at large is, in my opinion, or in his opinion, as important as doing scientific research. Did the people covered in your book put out any efforts in this direction? Isn't public support very important in big scientific projects? Some of them did, but, but largely no. Because, uh, you know, there is a... And, and and I do feel that it's not really uh, important for scientists to uh, to go out if they want to. I mean, not everybody is good uh, in that sense. You know, they have they don't have the skills to go and, and get some talk to somebody. Some people do, and they should. Uh, but it's not necessary that everybody should. So what what should happen? There should be a mechanism to communicate. You know, even if the scientists themselves don't communicate, there should be a mechanism, and which actually is through the media. You know, when journalists call up a scientist to talk to them about their work, it should be available, you know, within certain limitations. I mean, uh, so that is the way to communicate science. And, but unfortunately, it, it's a vicious cycle. Um, the media, the amount of science that it co is get, gets covered in the media is not that much. Um, although the, the amount of science in India has been increasing, the, the amount of coverage in the media has not been increasing proportionately. In fact, in many places, it's, it's actually decreasing. Uh, because of the perception that this is not important. And maybe a, a change in the, the way 
media does stories media means you know it's a very big term uh, i would i used to say newspapers and magazines uh, rather than the media um if you if you talk think about what people are interested then you always pick, tend to pick the long th- the wrong thing uh, you would ask the question what is important and what is significant and and then once d- you decide what is significant then you see how you communicate this you no know? um that is not the way made uh, newspapers work they always think of what is interesting what more people are like to read and then you going down a path which is uh, very very destructive uh, you will always find uh, people interested in unimportant things uh, unfortunately yeah yeah that's 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 interesting see for example we uh, yeah, have to celebrate the work of a govind swarup or a sharma or those people after they have done their work not during the time they did that work and that is something that we will have to bring about the change as they are working now we have to celebrate the work that they are doing and you know i mean the the, the media cannot sit in judgment as to whether it is a big work small work etc i think there we have to the scientific community will have to help in projecting those type of stories in the media etc so any final comments from the two of you as we come to the end of the program I I just comment that I really enjoyed the book it was a really fun read of a part of the history that I think we don't know enough about it and it's brought together in in a really fascinating way so I want to congratulate Harry for writing this I hope he will go on to expand it a little okay. more maybe not 1500 pages but just enough <laughs> to fill in the, the the few the few remaining edges that there are and I think you no know, this should be a, a model for Indians to think about what it is that they have achieved under what sort of odds and to credit the people who went before for the right sorts of things and to re- and to remember that it's not just politicians that dictate our current state but also the people who have brought changes in the way that we think in our social responsibilities in our responsibilities as educators as well and i think these are stories that hari brings out very well thank you hari hari would you like you. Uh, gautam menon to prescribe the book as text mandated text oh, i would love I, as many people <laughs> i want as many people to read uh, you know as i can um, you know it is written for people uh, right from 11th standard all the way up to you know uh, a, a, whatever age they can read uh, it, it's a very very wide audience uh, it's not meant only for scientists and i'm sure scientists can uh, also read it and understand uh, and enjoy it. um yeah i i i think the book uh, from the conversation that i have been part of uh, it is going to inspire a lot of people it will inspire a lot of people because it is the people and their achievements that really show the path uh, and mm-hmm. i hope that continues thank you very much thank you very much for sharing your time with the chennai international center i hope the audience enjoyed it we will try and make this available to a larger audience in schools and colleges and hopefully talk about this book so that it gets read by as many people who are interested in science as possible thank you thank you over thank to you vanita thank you so much that was such an insightful uh, discussion i mean i was just enjoying and making notes of all that you were saying and thank you so much for being part of this discussion and uh, thanks to the audience who have joined us today uh, we we will communicate about our next program uh, over the course of the next week uh, it's i think it's going to be on electric vehicles we are still uh, working the panel together so we hope to be in touch thank you so much thank you professor gautam and uh, mr pulak and thanks lot thank you thank you thank you thank you good, good evening good night everyone